Welcome, everybody. Good morning. Great keynote. This is From Flashlight to Floodlight, Using the Kanban Lens, a Government Case Study. I'm Nate Conroy. I'm Marini Boyd. And I have good news. Kanban works really well for government services. <laughs> but <laughs> he said, remove that slide. Um, oh. <laughs> but we, we didn't actually tell people to use Kanban. We just asked them to make their work visible, apply whip limits, and not start more than they can finish. So I am a federal contractor and an accredited Kanban trainer, and I would like to take you on the same journey that I went through, getting to know the Solutions Development Directorate in the US Department of Homeland Security. And like a lot of Kanban folks, I got to know them through their boards, their data, their teams, and my co-presenter and I are gonna share what we learned at each stage and how Kanban practices resulted in a floodlight of visibility about the organization services. So we undertook a discovery process using the Kanban lens, and here's what we learned. Start where Kanban practices are already in use, even if they go by different names. Look for patterns and trends in the data, and validate sources of dissatisfaction. So I was really amazed by this great historical data set. We found this large volume of cards entered into a JIRA system and I pulled this data at the beginning of August. There was 140,067 cards, and they had been entered by over 1,000 individuals. This is more than two times the roster of this organization. So what that suggested to us is that there is a commitment to making work visible that lasts beyond the tenure of any one individual. It is a real dedication, you know, 140,000 times doing anything is a lot if you imagine clicking create that many times to enter these cards. So we also found a number of boards being used already and cards being entered on this board and we recognized it as forms of team Kanban, even some full workflow Kanbans, there were some interconnected boards as well as upstream boards and shared services. And they weren't all fully implemented, but it did signal that the organization had some experience modeling workflow steps. And I'm sure all of you know, just being able to identify a column, being able to break down work into a discrete item that can move across that workflow is no small feat at a lot of organizations. So that was very positive. We also found an increasing number of items tracked to done each year. So here in this chart, the x-axis shows time and the columns show the number of cards that were resolved. And you can see that it is increasing year over year. And in 2020, there was an increased commitment to remote work, and we saw a big jump there. And then in 2021, there was an official portfolio management initiative that began. And so we've had a lot, of, lot more cards moving to done. And of course, yes, we like identifying the items. Yes, we like identifying the steps, but you also have to move those to done. So that was also very positive. And that showed us that people knew how to track work to done, and they knew what done was. And we also found that all of the existing work fit one of four heights, and it corresponded to feedback loops for days, weeks, months, and there are also risks and plans of action and milestones in the government that tend to operate on longer cycles. And the primary terminology that they use for this is tasks and stories, epics, and projects. And so this signaled an ability to scale flow management at multiple heights, even if they didn't call it that. We also found teams of all sizes visualizing work, entering cards, tracking them to done, 
And all of these teams were using either a form of Kanban or Scrum, and we found a wide variety of team processes and maturity in use. First, there's a mega team managing a large collection of services that weren't broken down very much. At the 20 person range, there were some teams running large successful services. Below that, there are teams running internal support services and also smaller teams. And then there are a lot of teams on the books with just one person, which to me represents teams that are forming, reflecting that the organization is continuously redefining the way they're organized. And it's really nice using Kanban that we are able to uh, not have to have a reorg and a cookie cutter set of teams uh, and team structures to get started. And this signaled that there was some depth of the Kanban implementation. But how did these pieces assemble into a larger picture? Well, I learned this historical fact that actually some of the teams predated the organization in its current form and name. And so I wondered, was the organization learning any patterns or trends from this data? And I, it turned out that looking at their services as a unified whole was a relatively new idea. So in aggregate, well, we, we did see all those positive things of making work visible. We found signals of overburdening that suggested meeting commitments would become more difficult as the work grew. And here we see a graph showing a count on the y-axis and time on the x-axis, and it's the count of unresolved cards increasing every month. So when you see this scenario, it's likely that workers will feel perpetually behind. They'll say, we can never catch up. And it's common in an organization that's pretty successful and is growing. And so here's another graph. The red lines here show created issues each month, and the green lines show resolved issues. And when more items are created than resolved, then this actually is data that can provide an explanation for trouble that people are feeling in meeting commitments. So the successful delivery that was going on was creating more demand, and that's what was the source of the overburdening. This is a really common story. Workers feel that overburdening, mid-level managers lose the ability to control delivery, and senior managers lose trust in the information that they're receiving. And static, the systems thinking approach to implementing Kanban, we call these sources of dissatisfaction. So static helped us understand how to work with the sources of dissatisfaction and start to pursue evolutionary change. And it was pretty well received. Leaders at all levels noticed the trends and it was powerful because it validated what they were feeling about the work growing out of balance. And some even recognized that this overburdening can lead to reduced job satisfaction and that staff departures as a result would be very costly. And even theoretically, if enough commitments are missed, it could shake faith in the organization to perform its duties or complete its mission. So avoiding these risks provided motivation for evolutionary change. So I've described so far a purely flow and data-oriented view of this organization. And I would like to introduce Marini to share more about the Solutions Development Directorate what their services are, and where their customer demand comes from. Over to you. Great. So I'm Marini Boyd. I lead the Agile Methods team in the Solutions Development Directorate. Um, this team was founded in 2020 to standardize and scale and elevate the Agile methods within our directorate. So we're one of those shared internal service teams that Nate showed you in a previous slide. Um, so we're a team of Agile coaches and JIRA experts. Um, and we provide Agile coaching and training, um, also metrics and report interpretation expertise, maestro configuration, which is what we call our, our JIRA instance at DHS, as well as value stream mapping support. So a big focus of our team is helping SDD teams to become more customer driven. So let's dig into that. 
So applying a customer-driven view, we learned our Kanban system should make work being performed for customers visible. A customer-driven view helps us to understand fit for purpose. And our sources of demand include customers receiving services, but also oversight authorities. So our senior managers deal directly with their counterparts in our customer organizations, and they need to be able to make promises that they can keep based on accurate information. And they needed a much better way to explain to customers the services that we provide in detail and in real time so that they can show how we're achieving the required business outcome. So Nate talked about workers being motivated um, to change, needing relief from overburdening, and mid-level mid managers needing to be able to avoid miscommitments. Our senior leaders are highly motivated to avoid being on the front page of the Washington Post. We don't want business failures. Um, and we don't want to direct, that would directly impact the Homeland Security mission, right? So they don't want news to arrive too late and they want to be able to intervene early. So this motivation pushed us to improve our Kanban systems to get them that customer information directly, not from presentation slides. So they do actually answer phone calls. They need to be able to get this information themselves. So to evolve to a customer-driven organization, we turn to Kanban's view of services. So here we see a customer, um, someone who needs something, and we see a request being submitted to a service responding to that need. So we see the request moving across a set of workflow steps, and we see the customer need fulfilled. So thanks to Travis Birch for this image. Let's apply that at DHS. So applying con that Kanban lens to DHS, we see requests from within our department. We are the third largest cabinet level department after DOD and the Department of Veteran Affairs. Um, we also get requests uh, from other federal, state, local, tribal, territorial, and um, international government organizations, as well as the private sector and the general public. So that is a large scope of, that, that is a lot of people. <laughs> um, and the demand for these services can go across a lot of different mission areas. So you see some examples here, such as defense, emergency management, law enforcement, intelligence. Um, this is really to say that understanding who our customer is can be very complicated. Often the organization that requests work from our directorate can be different than the organization who funds that work, which can be different than the organization that our end user belongs to. So within the Solutions Development Directorate, we provide highly technical solutions and perform complex knowledge work. We deliver a range of platforms and infrastructure services as well as more specific mission um, operational applications. So understanding the nature of our customer demand connects fit for purpose to our services to the Homeland Security mission. So what does that really look like? Um, we are responsible within DHS for defining our government cloud and moving DHS out of data centers into that cloud and refactoring applications to take advantage of that posture. We also are responsible provide it for providing trusted identity exchange. So as a, a, a newer department in the scope of things, um, we have had to help integrate and provide those identity attributes across all of the different components within the department, and that's around 240,000 employees, just to give you an idea of the scale, um, across their different systems for things like single sign-on or access to mission-specific applications. We also have um, operational systems such as the Homeland Security Information Network, or HISN, um, which help with providing information sharing and collaboration applications for different levels of government and different mission areas. Um, so as an example, HISN has been used for um, event planning and um, operational monitoring during a lot of large public safety events, such as most of the recent Super Bowls or 
um, even higher level security events such as um, the State of the Union address, um, when the Pope visited in 2015, that, those kinds of things. Um, they also help for more steady state kinds of things. So if um, in some states, public, sc public school administrators and law enforcement and emergency responders will collaborate and share school safety plans so that in the event of something horrible like a school shooting, they have that information ready and they're prepared for disaster response. Um, so those are kind of things that we can plan for and that we work to support. Um, we also get calls from the White House for work uh, that, that we can't plan for, that they needed yesterday really big, important things, such as when the government fell in Afghanistan, and um, we needed to, to help with supporting people who are being evacuated. So here we had disparate data sources from within the Department of Homeland Security, but also the Department of State, Health and Human Services, um, and various NGOs, the State Department. We had to bring all of that information together to create applications um, that would support uh, when the refugees would come, they could be processed through for humanitarian aid, for, for medical employment and resettlement assistance. So just to give you a, a, an idea of the kinds of scope of service that we provide, it's, it's pretty varying. And um, remember that in addition to those traditional customers, so the people who are using those systems I just described, um, we work on behalf of the public, and that means that um, we're highly regulated and audited continuously. And so our systems, in addition to helping us to be responsive to our customers, we also need to produce a constant stream of evidence that we are meeting goals and that we are complying with target, our compliance targets. And we want to do this without data calls um, and, and really burdensome status reports. So. Um, in the words of Mark Schwartz, a previous CIO within DHS, we are striving to operate a lean bureaucracy using um, information directly from our Kanban systems. And understanding what makes each service fit for purpose helps us uh, in turn to design our network of Kanban systems, which Nate will talk about next. Thanks very much. Yeah, I feel like we save so much time being able to generate these things directly. That was referenced earlier. Um, the best, one of the best things Kanban can give us is more time to pursue improvement and to fulfill important missions. So after we applied the Kanban lens to understand current practices in the organization, we worked with all these teams to design and socialize Kanban systems to align with this customer-driven viewpoint that Marini just spoke about. And then uh, we learned to support both simple and advanced board designs upstream and downstream for services at different maturity levels. And it was important to establish a clear policy throughout the organization on a commitment point, meaning when are we going to dedicate limited resources to do something um, having a clear commitment point enabled us to design any custom workflows that people wanted, but we could still get enterprise lead times. And I just wanted to mention, essentially, the first one is just start where you are. That's what we really like. We were able to work with teams um, as they were and not put a lot of requirements on them to get started with our services. So we worked with service managers, scrum masters and any team member who emerged as a leader to design or refine existing boards. You know, running a system for this long, there was boards that people really loved and tended to and gardened and other boards that had, you know, fallen by the wayside. And so we refined all of these. And at all the heights, we were able to start with the simple workflow of to do in progress, blocked and done. And this is a JIRA column view. So setting a commitment point enabled us to get lead time. Setting a column max enabled us to establish whip limits, which was new for some of the teams. And dragging blockers to a column, we found was the best way to nudge people to actually flag blockers. And this gave us a list of blockers, a common list of reasons, and a total time that items spend in blocked. 
So we're able to move into blocker clustering, one of the great techniques I learned about at one of these Kanban global summits. Um, for services needing custom workflows, we implemented them. So here's an example of some steps pending review, submitted to compliance. This is some compliance-oriented workflow. And we could accommodate this because all of the workflow steps in the enterprise are mapped to three status categories, to do, in progress, and done. And because the first in progress column is always the commitment point, we can calculate consistent enterprise lead times. So this meant we could model workflow as actually practiced. For teams getting started, uh, we found a team Kanban approach to be very helpful. Team Kanban is when a group of people essentially get together and say, hey, I like visualizing work, you like visualizing work, let's do it together on the same board so that we can have some shared awareness. And so here are some swim lanes by person. And note that this board does not have whip limits, um, but this was a great way to get started without putting any process obstacles or standards in their way. And as a result, they started entering cards and became familiar with paying attention to lead times. Starting where we are, the Team Kanban. We also helped services managing defects, incidents, and other triage workflows to model swim lanes by severity. So here we have the highest severity shown as the top swim lane, and additional classes of severity shown in other swim lanes. And so this helped get us started with classes of service. And again, we don't necessarily have to really focus on the terminology, but these practices, people find them so useful that they'll just use them and then our Kanban practitioners can build around that. So here's an example of a simple triage workflow that we implemented because people wanted to either accept or deny incoming defects onto their board. And this is shown here in a workflow view from JIRA. And when it passes this workflow, we'll know, is that ready for commitment? So they really wanted a way to adjudicate these items, and we recognized that we could apply the ideas of upstream Kanban to help these folks. Now, probably in most of your organizations, if you have a lot of demand, which you probably do because you're in business, you'll see major projects starting themselves all the time. Uh, especially if you have an organization where people pride themselves on saying yes. And so we're usually asking ourselves, well, where do all these projects come from? You know, how do they get created? And so we implemented an intake board to help manage these major efforts. And that includes steps of discovery to review technology and policy that lead to trade-off decisions about limited resources. Uh, and they do reviews, and at the conclusion, the project may either be committed uh, or it may be reworked into a new option or is declined. And so this was great because this gave us an opportunity to implement upstream Kanban at the highest height in the organization, which is the project level. We were also able to expand on interconnected boards, building out that network of boards, that network of services, and combinizing each service at the pace that was appropriate for the folks involved. And so here we see a triage process for tickets. And in progress here refers to the triage being in progress. You know, someone mentioned yesterday that work upstream doesn't always break down in the same way that work downstream does. And so here, once the card reaches the assigned to dev stage, it actually becomes demand. It becomes an item that goes on somebody else's board, um, which in this case, uh, it was actually a team using Scrum. And so they will need to select that card during their sprint planning. And when they resolve it, then it moves to done on the original board. And so we recognize that as building out our network of interdependent services. And our last example is aggregate boards. 
which is something that is highly enabled by the electronic Kanban solutions. So in this example, cards reside on boards with which customers interact. And so we have a data table here showing a number of customers who do business with the Solutions Development Directorate. And it's showing the number of items in to do, in progress, and done for the last three full months. And this is really great because they transparently get a view into the work that's going on for, that they care about for each customer. But we're able to aggregate all of these items onto a common view that somebody who is acting as a service delivery manager uh, is able to use to manage priorities across customers. And they can also manage overall flow with an aggregate cumulative flow diagram, which is shown here in the JIRA reporting tool. It shows the number of issues on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. So we got our service delivery review. And you know, if you've taken the Kanban management professional class, the uh, classes, uh, the content there talks about how this is often an emergent role, or somebody is doing this role, but they may not call it that. And just for context, remember, all of these boards were designed to align with the customer-driven view that Marini talked about. Uh, you know, all of these cards, this just churn of entering items into the system over 10 years, uh, are implementing a variety of technical services and knowledge work, and we've got some examples here for you to peruse. So now, Marini, let's talk about how these boards are actually being used. You happen to be a federal product owner yourself. I am. And I wondered if you could tell us about the feedback loops and the team cadences that you use. Absolutely. So all of our teams are running cadenced reviews and meetings at some level of Kanban maturity. So to give you guys a real example, I'd like to share my experience as a federal manager and product owner managing our services and the Agile Methods team in a hands-on way every day. Um, building feedback loops into our cadence meetings and reviews has been a really powerful tool for me to manage my team. <clears throat> All right. <laughs> there we go. Um, and remote Kanban is a success story for us. Our organization committed to fully remote work after it was proven successful during the pandemic. Um, we work across a variety of time zones and have different work styles and personal situations. Um, as an example, uh, there are a few members of our directorate who live in Hawaii, and I myself happen to live in Tel Aviv, Israel right now, and um, we make it work. And a lot of that is because our work is visible in our boards and the, the statuses are, are up to date. Um, so my work week starts with a replenishment meeting. Um, before we start, I ask the team to make sure um, that our board is up to date, are all of our cards in an accurate status and in the right column? Um, have they provided and have I provided um, an update on every card at least within the last four days? and um, just making sure that everything is appropriately mapped. So do our tasks all align to an appropriate epic, for example. I also look at um, the cards that are currently in progress and if there are cards that didn't make it out of to do the previous week. I participate in this because my work is also visualized in cards. The next thing I do ahead of this meeting, I, I look at the recent um, weekly throughput and I try to see, you know, are there significant trends that would suggest that we need a change in our WIP limits or in how I'm approaching planning. Um, so this chart here, this graph is from a JIRA plugin called All-in-One Reports and we see completed cards visualized as vertical bars and the weeks are on the x-axis. So Looking at eight weeks um, of throughput works pretty well to smooth out uh, anything where there's an, you know, an abnormality, such as um, week 30, where we only completed 11 items. We had quite a few people in conferences and on vacation. Um, but our average tends to stay near 20 cards. 
So we base our board whip limits um, on the weekly throughput of 20 cards, and it's currently set to nine items allowed in progress and 10 items allowed in our to-do. Um, our team has 10 members, but most of them are not full-time, and um, they are accountable to pull work on other boards. So not having fully dedicated team members is a reality for, for many of our teams. Um, and we see the work in progress limits as a means to encourage collaboration. So, you know, rather than everyone pulling their own card um, and working on it individually, there's this, a push for collaboration. So our WIP limit fits both the number of people on the team and our throughput data. Um, and we can see this validated in the data. So this is a JIRA plugin called Structure. Um, let's break this down. So we're the Agile Methods team. Um, we provide that internal support to the rest of the organization. So it's important that we are modeling this data-driven replenishment in a way that shows other teams and proves these practices are possible. So we're hoping to inspire others that we sh sip our own champagne. Um, our team came into existence in fiscal year 2020, and so we've made more cards visible each year. You can see that card count increasing. And even without knowing the details of the work, the number of cards gives a sense of the volume of work that our team is making visible. So we monitor our average lead times, and those are shown here as the average duration in progress. Um, and we see our average duration for the full existence of the team. So um, that's in a day, hour, and minute format. So our lead times have dropped from three weeks when we were getting started um, down to one week and a day, and now to just under five days this year. In addition, we track cards that are closed without being completed. So this could be canceled, um, duplicate, declined, won't do, overtaken by events. Um, and so you can see our throughput graph here that's um, stacked vertical bars that'll show done, plus those discarded or dropped items. And that's very healthy. Um, that indicates a healthy process. So we started tracking discards last year, and we show an overall rate of 6% of those cards dropped after the commitment point, 9% discarded before committing resources. And so that drop rate is down from 8% to 5% this year, which might signal that we have more effective replenishment policies. So we're not pulling in cards we don't actually need, and we're discarding them instead. Um, this is, discarding them is a really important part of trimming the tail on our epics. Um, when knowledge work ends, especially agile methods work, it's not very clear. <laughs> um, so learning to trim the tail is a bit challenging. So um, during the replenishment meeting, we talk about if we've achieved enough value on the epic. Um, is this project actually complete? Has it actually met the scope, the intended scope? Um, can we write an accomplishment for this work and send it up to leaders? So um, we found that when programs ask the Agile Methods team for help, um, we'd start an epic and fill it with um, ideas, right, of what actions we could take to solve the problem that they asked us to work on. Um, but as we continued to work with them, we found our epics were growing bigger, and we would continue to identify more work that we could do to help the agile methods of that group. Um, so as a product owner, I had a really hard time talking to my boss about the value being delivered by those epics. They were vague, and they weren't finished. Um, so, and we were getting more requests all the time within the organization as they heard about the help that other teams were getting. They wanted some. So um, I had to start trimming the tail on those epics. We can't start new work with other teams until we finish with the existing teams that we're working with. And so a lot of that is looking at the stories, the ideas that we would generate, and saying, you know what, we actually don't need to do those. Let's trim the tail. The value that we were originally asked for has been achieved. Um, and sometimes it means starting a new epic for that same customer team, right? So 
um, taking some of those good ideas and putting them into a different epic, it's just not the most important thing that the team needs to focus on now. So um, by trimming the tail and closing out those epics, we're able to stay focused and we're ready to pivot to new work um, when teams come to us with pressing problems or opportunities. So as a result of trimming the tail, you can see here, um, our epics are more predictable. So this is a visualization from JIRA. Um, it's a control chart. So the green dots show our epic lead times and the X axis, um, that the Y axis is the number of days. The green dots on the, are showing the, uh, the date that the epic transitioned to done. So you can see the outliers at the beginning of the time period. And you can see um, epics are supposed to represent value, significant value delivery. So we don't want them to close too fast or stay open too long. Um, but this funnel shape shows a narrowing of the time that epics take in both directions. So that would indicate that we're getting increasingly predictable. Trusting our systems means that I have accurate information about our capacity, and instead of finding out later that we can't complete the work, um, I'm able to make different choices during our replenishment meetings. Uh, and we're working, in a, we're working together in a pretty contractor-heavy environment. So in our organization, there are five or more contractors for every federal employee. Um, and in that environment, managing utilization and status reports from each individual would just take way too much time. Um, and it might incentivize busyness rather than delivery. So um, Kanban boards and the data that um, comes from them has helped our team to mature in managing work, not people. And the board gives me the information I need to up manage and down manage with confidence, um, ensuring reliable delivery. Um, and as a note, uh, I also am a contracting officer representative. Um, if any of you work with the government, so I'm contractually responsible for making sure the government gets the value that it needs from its, its contract. Um, and having this level of information and these daily feedback loops has helped me to manage with confidence without needing to get increasingly specific in terms of deliverables. So we have a daily Kanban meeting. Um, so this energizes and aligns our team every day. Um, everyone takes a turn sharing their screen. Everyone takes a turn facilitating. Um, and we review the board and we check from right to left looking for blockers and aging items. We've also built some automations into our board to validate um, that everyone's following policies. So those are gonna, all of our validations are gonna come here on the screen. Um, there are so many things to check. So unlike a physical board, um, virtual boards are easy to minimize, to not update, to avoid clicking. Um, and the validations just help us to follow our own policies. So it really helps with the mental load. We also have um, retrospectives. So monthly retrospectives were good, uh, but we've recently added in frequent five minute retros at the end of certain meetings. And we found that those tiny improvement sessions have been even more effective than the longer meeting held less frequently. Um, and so we're having a lot of fun today presenting from slides, um, but our program management reviews are, slides are banned. Um, so briefings have to be done directly from the visual system and no presentation slides allowed. So that ties the information in those briefings directly to the flow metrics, which um, make the information more credible and our senior leaders find it more trustworthy. So, these reviews confirm that a service's cards make sense as a part of the enterprise portfolio, and they help to escalate blockers and resource decisions that need leader intervention. So as a result, um, many leaders have followed that format and they've moved their weekly meetings into a visual system as well. Um, lastly, road mapping. Um, at first, we did roadmap sessions every two weeks, and that was great. 
Um, but then we found that when we were starting new work that we really needed to add on-demand sessions with starting new epics. So we started to, this started to help to align our work and reduce our, our lead times. Um, but this is not just about getting teams to do things well internally. This is about coordinating across programs. So I'm going to turn it back over to Nate to talk about why our organization was motivated to pursue evolutionary improvement. Thanks. All right. So what are some of the things we learned pursuing evolutionary change? Well, coaching, training, and tooling support are essential. Providing starter policies to answer these common questions such as which columns count as WIP was really important. We gave gold stars for clean data. We do need accurate information in the system. That goes right up to the senior leader agenda. And we also came to believe that predictability unifies the agendas of workers, mid-level managers, and senior leaders. So we simplified our core messages to things that resonated with people. Of course, these are classics. If too many things are in progress, very little will get done and that we need to be able to see when commitment and delivery are out of balance and understand why. And people heard that, right? Whenever we would get into too many details, just bring it back to these simple ideas and say, hey, that's why we're asking you to work with us or to figure out how to visualize your work or your workflow. And it really resonated. So we also created a new Kanban-driven training class Again, not focused on the terminology, but just focused on cr this idea of creating balanced systems. And we tied that with hands-on tooling and then followed it up with coaching to address those sources of dissatisfaction. We provided starter policies, so just straightforward policy guidance on things that come up over and over again that are tricky. You know, We asked people to please make all work visible on the board, including previously hidden items. Everything not in the backlog and not yet done is WIP, including if it's blocked or on some other team's board or, or dependent on another team. And we asked them to try not to move work backwards. And of course, we always said, if someone considers uh, any of these actions career limiting, then just make the board reflect reality and don't do anything that's gonna get you in trouble. But over time, we wanna work towards balanced systems the simple idea of the same number of cards moving out as the number of cards coming in. And using tools is very challenging. Um, we happen to work, we have mentioned Jira, we, it's known to have a challenging user interface um, and that's the environment that we're in. And your typical knowledge workforce is going to have varying levels of computer savvy, so you can never start too simply with your explanations. You found, you've seen today we've been mentioning the x-axis and the y-axis, so here's an example of an explanation we give. This flow graph shows the number of cards in progress on your Jira board. Plotting this number each day creates a shape that can be interpreted. From this graph we can make an initial interpretation whether this is a balanced system, and we'll point out the scale is dynamic. Watch out for those shifting scales. You know, time is on the x-axis. These are actually thin columns that show the number of items in progress each day. And you want to look for peaks and valleys to reflect on. So we always want to make sure to not leave anybody behind and take the time to teach people hands-on. Um, we slow way down in our expectations of what's going to get done in meetings. We ask others to share their screens, which is an act of courage and leadership to be willing to share your screen. And that'll also help you see any problems that they have with permissions or tef technical difficulties with the tool, which can totally derail people. And we highly recommend in that meeting get a specific commitment from people. Okay, you went over it with us. Now pick an existing meeting that you have when you're going to go over your board and your flow data. So they will try it at home and not just when we're together. Um, we also gathered real examples from our organization of graphs showing increasing WIP, decreasing WIP, and balance so people had a point of reference. And we gave people practical actions for common situations. Um, for example, if the graph doesn't show daily updates, add a cadence for regular board updates. If the data doesn't look accurate, close abandoned work that's causing clutter. If WIP is increasing, set WIP limits. If long-running items are keeping WIP high, then swarm to resolve them. 
If blockers are inflating WIP, then resolve the root cause. And finally, cancel work that you no longer need or that you don't have time to work on right now. So keeping electronic cards orderly is challenging, but it's necessary if you're going to have an enterprise view with information leaders can trust. And um, you know, with cards at multiple heights, they do need to stay in sync if they're connected. And so we wrote little bits of code to find these inconsistencies, and we automated data health dashboards to give people gold stars, and they were surprisingly receptive to this. You know, you click on the number, you open the card, you fix the issue, and you get this immediate feedback. Uh, they like that. So give it a try. Elevating emergent standards is important. Don't come up with them yourself arbitrarily. You don't want them to be seen as arbitrarily. The emergent standards are the true standards. And this is an example. We could see the flow of a project card to done, uh, which signifies a significant delivery of value. 85% of those were completing in 28 weeks and six days. So we started socializing the idea that leaders could expect significant value accomplishments, which are very important in this space to be produced at that rate. We also focused on trimming the tail. Here's an example of a distribution of completed cards broken down by lead time. Graphed, it looks like this. And so we worked with teams to understand why did these 48 items here take the longest so that we can trim the tail and make the work more predictable because that unifies the agenda of relief from overburdening for workers, meeting commitments for mid-level managers, and senior leaders being able to prevent business failures. So we increased emphasis on predictability as teams matured, and this control chart does a good job visualizing predictability. You can configure the tool to show items transitioning to done and display predictability as a standard deviation range, which is the blue range here. And so as teams matured, we said, hey, focus on that blue range and get that tighter and more fit for purpose. So let's summarize how it started and how it's going. We started with a large amount of cards entered into a common system. You can guess I like data, so I was happy about this because I thought I could learn from it. Um, Kanban practices worked really well for us. We could see the work, the workflow steps, and flow across the organization. Policies helped us see if we had clean data. Scaling Kanban helped us see work at multiple levels. Kanbanizing services over time helped us see upstream, developing options, and where boards were interconnected. And applying classes of service and trimming the tail helped us see differences in work based on how long we expected it to take versus how long it actually took. Throughput and lead time enabled us to see which services were predictable. Discard, drop rate, and blocker information enabled us to see when work wasn't going according to expectations. Counting data health issues helped us see whether our data was accurate. And unresolved items helped us put data to this feeling of overburdening. And socializing this shared set of da data visualizations, shown here on the right, helped us all see the data in the same way. Next, cadences enabled us not just to have the data, but to actually use it and do something with it for decision making during replenishment and flow review, daily Kanban meetings, retros, program management reviews, and road mapping. And lastly, the Kanban principles and the systems thinking approach to implementing Kanban enabled us to see these team practices, data, and their use of feedback loop and cadences as part of a larger picture of organizing, uh, of organizational change. So key ideas for us were a service orientation, being customer driven, analyzing demand and uh, sources of dissatisfaction, understanding fit for purpose, obtaining agreement to pursue evolutionary change, and managing work, not people, and starting where we are, increasing the depth of Kanban. So uh, these allowed us to clearly see, with the floodlight, a maturing organization, where we were, where we are, and where we're going. And that's what we have for you. Thank you.
I think we have time for a question or two. Um, so you mentioned your intake uh, board. Um, you know, it strikes me as uh, another term that, that we've used for those types of ideas, a portfolio Kanban. I mean, essentially it's your portfolio Kanban. So, um, you know, and, and that will vary depending on the types of the projects, that the sources of demand, where the projects are coming from. So you said that you found that useful. Do you have any other observations about that in terms of <clears throat> how it's affected the, uh, the uh, rest of the teams and the, the work that's flowing through the system? I mean, is it, it's been effective for you or uh, has it been anything that you've been able to measure or come up with uh, a, a feeling about how effective it's been? Well, yeah, I mean, in terms of measurement, we never had a real count. We didn't know where projects were started. Um, a key issue is that delivery people responsible for keeping you know, things flowing were being pulled over to intake kind of on the side. And so it was, it was just making all of that visible um, that are the things that come to mind most. And what would you add, Marini? Also allowing our senior leaders to see places where different programs potentially could be collaborating where they weren't before. Just I, a lot of it really is about that visualization. You know, also we, um, we put a lot of work into creating customer views, customer portals, yeah. organizing all the work by customers. And Marini mentioned just how hard it is even understanding who the customers are and naming them. And being able to visualize things that are in progress for customers, you know, show them that work and also say, well, here are the new things you've requested that we haven't accepted yet. Kanban does a really good job of making that distinction between a request being submitted and it actually being accepted. Um, you know, you don't think of that in your like retail examples because when you pay for a, transition, a transaction, you, they accept it right away. But in an organization where the resources are so expensive, it's, it's really important to um, have that distinction and not say yes to everything. Great question, thank you. Yeah, hi, my question was just about um, agile methods, you know, the, the inevitable question. So did you have, um, I know there's many different agencies under DHS and there may not be a lot of uh, standards that are promulgated across all of them, but uh, I know in at least some of them, I believe SAFE is sort of a mandatory element. Um, it looks like here you had sort of a let live and let live, Scrum, Kanban, all of the above. Um, but you were able to use Kanban to connect, um, but you didn't use the word Kanban. So is that because people already had the word safe in their head or just because you just wanted to avoid getting into a needless argument? I mean, that's, that's my perspective is I just think that these practices are the fundamental things that help. And we wanted to avoid all distractions over methodology. Um, I would also say that you get different experiences in organizations with how much you can train and, ha and, and if you only have like an hour here and an hour there, then you just, it does cause you to focus on what you can fit in that time box. Um, so there's a lot of sensitivity because th this is real work being produced, tickets, services being maintained and you know, there's sensitivity to pulling people away from that. Um, so we kind of backed into it, right? We, our leaders right there, it's like, oh, this is actually connected to this whole world of amazing knowledge that you can use, you know, that, that we've just been giving you the, the tip of the iceberg on, so. I think it also helped us, um, we operate a lot on influence in the organization, and so rather than calling it something, just focusing on the what, and the, the value helped us to um, avoid resistance that we may have also otherwise encountered. Yeah. All right. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Thank you, Genevieve.